On the night you walked along Pike's Peak, Barrymore the butler, who made the discovery, sent Perkins the groom on horseback to you, and you were able to reach the Anselm Society Digital Pub within an hour of the event. You followed the footsteps down the U Alley, you saw the spot at the moor gate where he seemed to have waited, you remarked the change in the shape of the footprints after that point. You noted that there were no other footsteps save those of Barrymore on the soft gravel. And finally, you carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until your arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with some strong emotion to such an extent that you could hardly have sworn to his identity. There is certainly no physical injury of any kind. But one false statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there were no traces upon the ground round the body. He did not observe any. But you did. Some little distance off, but fresh and clear. Footprints? Footprints. A man's or a woman's? For an instant, you looked strangely at your co-hosts, Marcus Robinson and Matt Melema. Your voice sank almost to a whisper as you answered. Believe to see. They were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Uh, so just something I wrote up before the show, Marcus. Um, I am really excited for our topic today. Really? I'm very excited. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've, I'm feeling it. We've had some good days for this, too. We really yeah. have. We, we've had a blizzard recently, a cyclone NATO or whatever it was. Yeah. And these are days that put me in the mood for mystery. Oh. So I just like to, to get like, underneath the blanket, read. Kind of like Fargo? Not exactly like oh, Fargo. okay. See, no. I'm on the outside again. Well, that's okay. <laughs> okay. We, we will welcome Fargo fans, too. But for those of you who may not have picked up on my very subtle hint from the introduction, we are talking about detective novels today, uh, Sherlock Holmes among many others, and this was actually kind of an accomplishment on our part because uh, I, w I wanted to talk about detective novels for a long time, so I sent another uh, bat signal up to the Anselm folks see who knew a lot about detective novels. Turns out... Because you're oh, the commissioner. I'm apparently Commissioner Gordon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How, did we settle on who you are then? Um, no. I think I was. Yeah. It, I, I'm not comfortable in the Robin outfit. Mm. Mm. I don't know who would be. Maybe you could you be could you be Alfred? I could be Alfred. Okay. Yeah, I, I can clean stuff up. Oh, well, there we go. So we sent this up, and we had lots of people answering the call. Lots of lots of Batman's coming. Apparently, detective novels are kind of a thing yeah, in the guild. Quite a popularity, yeah. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. But first, let's talk about the person who won the Battle of the Batmans and is coming here. That is Woo! our guest today. So everyone, welcome to the pub table, Sarah Pottinger. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm good. All right, so tell me, what made you want to answer the bat signal and come up? What what makes you want to talk detective novels here oh. at the table? Well, I write mysteries, murder mysteries, usually with a detective and an amateur sleuth teaming up together. That's my favorite. And I've just been a lifelong mystery reader since Bobsy Twins. Bobsy Twins. Bobsy. Yes. I have heard the Bobsy <laughs> Twins. I've not... But they're what? obnoxious. Yeah, it's they're like Hardy Boys. Goody but... two shoes. Yeah. They're like Hardy Boys only. Goody two shoes. Okay. Yeah, and they more, solve more the light. Goody two shoes than, than the Hardy Frank Boys. And Joe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whoa. I just love Frank and Joe and their sweaters. Yep. I think I've already talked in this podcast about how much I love the Hardy Boys because of the use of the word presently. Yeah. If not, go back and find it because I love the word presently. But let's talk influence while we're here. We're we're all detective fiction fans, even though Marcus doesn't realize it yet. Yeah, no. So tell me, the Hardy Boys. tell me your influences growing up. What what are your favorite detective novels beside the the these Bobsy people? Bobsy. Bobsy people. Bobsy. Yeah. Bobsy. Bob it is Bobsy. Yeah. Okay. B o b b s e y. Okay. I had the whole set. It sounds wrong <laughs> to say Bobsy at a pub table. Well, you all talked to <laughs> him so much, I can't imagine me not going to look him up. But anyway, yeah, uh, other should. other detectives um, for you. I had this book, Encyclopedia Brown, of course. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. I had this book growing up that I found at the library and then bought. It was called Ten Minute Mysteries. And it was like these little scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to try and solve it. Mm -hmm. They were very... Like, it was for kids, so it wasn't anything murdery or 
<laughs> very scary. It was very like who stole my bike? Yeah. Oh, okay. Stolen stuff. By the way, if anyone wants to come stuff. up with a line of murdered mysteries for kids, that the market may be open. But that would like, be great. <laughs> <laughs> I would read it. <laughs> yeah. So I loved I loved the puzzles in those. Well, yeah. Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys. I had the. I didn't read much of them on their own, but the books where they would team up. Oh, I yeah, read I the snot out those. of those. I read them so much that they're. I still have them. They're really worn, you know. Before the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, are all the Bet's biggest and, crossover event. Yes. Hardy Boys right. and Nancy they were Drew. Great. Did Present one of the Hardy Boys ever like flirt with Nancy Drew, oh, or, did, yeah. or was that all platonic? Yeah. No. Really? Yeah. Oh. Joe was the big flirt, but okay. Frank was like the silent, broody flirt. Ooh. Kind of. Yeah, there was tension going on on both well, sides. Well, the girl detective's definitely going to go for the silent broody type, Oh, right? totally. Okay. Yeah, she she usually did. Yeah. I just remember... <laughs> <laughs> the one I remember is... The one I read the most was A Crime for Christmas. And they were in New York solving this mystery. And it was all about this, like, crown prince who was flirting with Nancy. And there were these chocolates that had bombs in them. Yeah. And part of... The plot was Joe climbing into where the chocolates were made, and he falls in a vat of chocolate. And so there's a scene where he comes out, and they're, like, breaking pieces of chocolate off him and eating it as it dries. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most ridiculous thing, but wow. I loved it. it was, well, there we go. Yeah. So, so maybe what I can do here, because <laughs> I, I have plenty of my own detective novels to throw into, I thought it would be helpful... To give just a little bit of background for the listeners, maybe some of the listeners are, I'm sure a lot of listeners are big fans, some of them may be Marcuses out there who don't realize they're big fans yet. Right. So I, I think I'm going to do a quick sketch of detective novels through history, and maybe once I get to them you can throw in like where, where your favorites come in, because okay. I feel like that's important where someone's favorites come in. So commonly, the, uh, the first detective novel as popularly received would be uh, Edgar Allan Poe, so his uh, Inspector Dupin. <laughs> or however you're supposed to say it in French. So the uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, that's probably the first detective story. So in there, it's basically just a super smart guy who, through the use of his acumen, solves this almost impossible lockbox mystery. Mm. Then we go, these are some of my personal favorites, uh, Wilkie Collins in the Sensation Novels. Mm. Have, have you come across any Wilkie Collins? I've read some. I've never made it through a whole one. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. So these were, so we're getting uh, like mid to late Victorian era, and these are basically tales of mystery and wonder that like the Moonstone and the Woman in White, where it's all these suspenseful stories that do have a mystery element, but there's a lot more uh, personal drama coming out. It's very gothic. Very like, gothic. Yeah. Very wonderfully gothic. Then next we get to Sherlock Holmes is probably the next big big marker here, and he's probably the first big popular one. And what a lot of people don't quite realize is, with like the craze with the Sherlock revamping recently, that's sort of how it was when Arthur Conan Doyle was writing them originally. Hugely popular, <laughs> still probably my favorites. My my grandpa Bob instilled a love of them in an early age which is probably why I quoted Hound of Baskervilles to start. <laughs> and then we get into the so-called Golden Age with the Detection Club. So we have Agatha Christie, G.K. Chesterton, Dorothy Sayers, um, Monsignor Ronald Knox, a lot of other figures. A lot of these guys were British. They're all these very, very twee, very... Uh, they're very complicated mysteries that may or may not have other literary elements thrown in. Uh, this is usually where I go to when I really just want a t detective novel fix. Give me Dorothy Sayers, Agatha Christie. Then we get into the, the hard-boiled American dramas, the uh, Raymond Chandlers, uh, the the sort of the hard-boiled gumshoe who's walking the, the American streets uh, for justice and blah, 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 blah. I don't like them quite as much. And finally, I love these guys. Special shout out. The Japanese Orthodox School or the Hankaku Mystery Writers. They're more recent, 80s and 90s, but they are Japanese writers who care a lot about the old-timey rules. I love rules, therefore I love them. <laughs> oh, man. And that kind of brings us to now. Wait, no, no, you skipped like a huge... I hit all the important things. What are you doing <laughs> that? There's one huge person you're leaving out. Who am I leaving out? Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> Scooby-Doo. That's a mystery. No, no. But I mean, yeah. somebody wrote this stuff, you know, and yeah. that's a huge influence so, in the whole mystery genre, I'm sure. I love Scooby-Doo. Until they brought Scrappy and killed mm -hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. As much as I love Scrappy-Doo, I hate... I love Scooby-Doo, I hate Scrappy. But that's, that could be a whole other podcast. Yeah. I love Scooby-Doo... 
for many reasons. One of them, wouldn't you just love some criminal somewhere to try a Scooby-Doo type crime? Where it's like, I have this smuggling ring, so I'm going to dress up as Bigfoot and scare everyone away. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I just want one to try it. Would it work? All you meddling kids. Yes, I just want someone to say that to me. I would have gotten away with meddling kids. Yeah. And yeah, that little dog, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back and watch some. Uh, but anyway, so with, with that sort of timeline, where does it resonate the most for you, Sarah? Hmm... Is there anyone you want like to add to the timeline? Specific ones, kind of. Mm -hmm. Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, aka Ten Little Indians, was yes. like super. I read that one to pieces also. Oh. That just fascinated me. It, and it just, was probably it, the first like semi gruesome mystery I read. I don't know how old I was, like 10 or 11. Oh, that, that book blew my mind. Yeah, it's incredible. Sherlock Holmes definitely. I think my junior year in high school, my school had a complete set of Sherlock Holmes stories in the library, and I checked it out my junior year and renewed it mm -hmm. until my senior year, because it took me that long to make my way through the whole wow. book. But yeah, so I've read them all. I it was loved, the compendium. Yeah. I don't, it was so long ago, I have trouble remembering specific ones. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done a lot of rereading, but those were super influential also. So, one of the, there's a lot of topics here I think we can talk about, but the first one I want to do is talking about what a mystery novel is and should be. Because even within this like little, this very brief chronology I ran through, you'll, you'll see different ebbs and flows. So, for instance, uh, Wilkie Collins cared more about like the human and the literary aspects. So they're very sprawling epic works that happen to have a mystery undergirding them. But I, I think Wilkie's trying for some sort of literature. Whereas a lot of the Golden Age, they're not really striving for literature. In fact, one of the uh, Golden Age uh, writers, uh, Van Dyne, wrote his 20 rules. <laughs> oh my gosh. You, you, I will give you plenty of time to rip on Van Dyne if you want. <laughs> but one of his rules for detective fiction was, hey, don't worry so much about characterization, description, all that stuff. We just A detective novel is basically a brain teaser in a book form. So you'll see these sort of two extremes. In most good detective novels, we'll have both. But the question is, which one is its uh, essence? Let's get all platonic or Aristotelian on this. Is a detective novel a story that happens to involve a mystery, or is it a brain teaser that happens to be in book form? I need you to give one or the other. <laughs> well, I think any good story needs more than just a brain teaser. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the brain teaser isn't enough to sustain a good story, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a way into the story, which is the characters, then I don't think there is gripping well, for most people. Let me give you the direct quotation from Van Dyne, and you can, again, tear into him, because he seems like he's kind of a weirdo. <laughs> Sorry, Van Dyne. Okay, he says, A detective novel should contain no long descriptive passages, no literary dallying with side issues, no subtly worked out character analyses, no atmospheric preoccupations. Such matters have no vital place in a record of crime and deduction. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, how did <laughs> Baskervilles break that anyway? Because yeah. talk about atmospheric. Yeah, I mean, yeah. honestly, that, that passage I re read for you about uh, Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. That is one of my favorite lines that's ever been written by a human being. I think it's <laughs> so great and so atmospheric. So would you come down then? It sounds like you think a, a detective novel should be a story that happens to have the mystery elements. Would that mm -hmm. be accurate? A, a good story with a mystery, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, Marcus, coming in as a yeah. soon-to-be detective novel nut, right. well, what are your impressions? <laughs> well, you know how I feel about rules, Matt, so... Do you uh, love them as much as I do? <laughs> almost. <laughs> so, I'm definitely going to be drawn much more into this story than I am trying to read something that is just a puzzle. That's uh, going to lose me rather quickly, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That's why I like Scooby-Doo. And what a character. Yeah. What an actor. Yeah, the character. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I boy. mean, Sherlock Holmes, like, half the appeal of that is how bizarre of a character he is. And yeah. The and way the, he does the things. The tension between him and Watson. And, and, yeah. 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 Yeah, I... 
Come I on, break see with where the you're rules. coming from. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm not going to. Are you going to be a Vulcan? You're going to be a Vulcan. I love rules. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you're, you guys are not going to get me to bash the rules. Um, because. It's my job. You know, he always says this, but then he ends up later on off, off the mic saying, okay, there's an exception. <laughs> that whole outlining thing. Yeah. No, this is why outlining is so important. Okay, all right. I'm For sure mysteries? I won't make this yeah. confession happen here. <laughs> okay. So, let me describe to you something that I feel is very important. That is the detection club from the golden age. Uh, can you actually pause it really quick? I need to bring the list up. <laughs> okay, so I have pulled up the Ten Commandments of Detective Fiction, written by uh, Monsignor Ronald Knox, who is a brilliant writer. Uh, you should just Second, read him right into the Bible. It's right into life. You should just read him in general, but in addition to being a very funny and pithy and clever uh, theologian and satirist, he was also a really accomplished detective fiction writer. And these are his Ten Commandments, and I hold most of them pretty tightly. I'll sh you'll know which one I I'm talking about here. Um, <laughs> one, the criminal must be someone mentioned in the early part of the story, but must not be anyone whose thoughts the reader has been allowed to follow. These are all good, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, one for one. I've Two. seen exceptions to it, but I mean, the argument is: well, were they good I'll, I'll, or? Uh, we'll just keep. You better keep. Okay, going. Sarah, you yeah. can come up with your exceptions soon. But right now, I'm laying down the rules given okay. to me by Ronald okay. Fox. Yeah. Two. Rules are made to be broken. All supernatural or preternatural agencies are ruled out as a matter of course. Three. Not more than one secret room or passage is allowable. <laughs> it's a very good rule. Four. No hitherto undiscovered poisons may be used, nor any appliance which will need a long scientific explanation at the end. Yeah. Number five uh, has to do with uh, Chinese characters in the story, which I will explain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ronald Knox put the rule in because in a lot of uh, pulp fiction of the time, uh, Chinese people were portrayed in very negative and very offensive stereotypes. And that's the reason he put the rule in. He, he made a line like, Obviously, Chinese people can be a mystery story. It's just let's stop with these stupid stereotypes. So that's why. That's the one rule I do not enforce anymore. Um, number six. No accident must ever help the detective, nor must he ever have an unaccountable intuition which proves to be right. That's an excellent. That, oh, Sarah, I'm seeing really? that smirk. No, oh, yes. My. Yes, okay. I, I will give you all of your rebuttal time to go against the rules set down by Ronald these Knox. These are gender specific for sure. Number six. <laughs> I'd like to see Agatha Christie just tear into this brother. Agatha Christie was a member of this detection club too. I'm sure she, she signed off. She subscribed to Alton? Oh, no. Most I of the time. She was probably like, hey, let's. Okay, she yeah. broke some of these rules. Yeah. yeah. Um, but only sometimes. Uh, number seven. The detective must not himself commit the crime. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 these are good rules. Number eight, the detective must not light on any clues which are not instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. Number nine, this is my favorite one, the stupid friend of the detective, the Watson, must not conceal any thoughts which pass through his mind. His intelligence must be slightly, but very slightly, below that of the average reader. Poor and number Watson. ten, twin brothers <laughs> and doubles generally must not appear unless we have been duly prepared for them. So, if I can summarize these rules. Uh, first of all, there's the one we talked about, which is basically, hey, stop doing offensive stereotypes. That's That sucks. But the other one is, all the other ones have to do with fair play. Basically, you should not, the detective should not solve the crime by any means other than what is available to the reader. So, theoretically, the reader should be able to go through, look at all the clues that have been presented, and arrive at the solution to the crime. That, in my That's opinion... That's a good guideline. That's yeah. a good guideline. A good They're rules. Guideline. They're not guidelines. It's a guideline. <laughs> <laughs> that is why the rules are so important, because that is a big part of the fun of the detective fiction. I agree. Good story is important. Those are all great. Like, I'm not saying, not, you know, doing a Van Dyne here. But I do think that you need to have all of that undergirded with rules so that the person can't solve along, because solving along is a big part of the fun of detective fiction. Now, Sarah, you're going to <laughs> rebut this with whatever. Okay, go ahead. Well, just to that point, I think there are people who read to solve and there are people who read to be surprised. The people who read to surprise are wrong. Uh, okay, <laughs> next point. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, keep no. going. I read to be surprised. Um, the one about his intuition... Yeah, a, a detective no. can't just, like, like a gut feeling can't yeah. be why he solved well, it. that's, like, what 
one of the things that makes detectives good detectives is that they have good intuition. So if you're taking away their edge over non-detectives, then I don't know. It doesn't set them apart as detectives anymore, I well, feel like. Well, I think we need to go back to... Uh, like, I wouldn't depend on it a ton, because that would be stupid, but... Well, I think that's what the rule is. It's that he can't depend on. Like, uh, okay. let's go back to Inspector Dupont from uh, Edgar mm-hmm. Allan Poe. He talks a lot in his intro to Murders at the Rue Morgue about the, the acumen, sort of special insight that the detective has. And that's an element of it. But in the end, he solves the murder of the Rue Morgues by a uh, very logical deduction. Now, maybe the intuition sort of kickstarted it, but mm-hmm. in the end, he was able to solve a logical chain of events that theoretically... Someone should be able to solve. <laughs> so let, let, let me put it to you maybe a little bit more stark. Do you think a detective novel should allow a reader, theoretically, to have all the clues necessary to solve the case? I think that a writer should be aware that some of the readers are reading to solve I don't think they need to, but I'm coming from a place of where I read to be surprised. So I'm sure that's skewing my viewpoint a little. Well, we, we've already established that's the wrong place. So. <laughs> and I mean, oh, I don't. Matt, <laughs> back down. <laughs> the thing is, I don't write to be surprised. I, when I write a mystery, I have to know what's going to happen mm-hmm. so I can build up to it. So I'm not. I write differently than I read for mysteries. Well, well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I have thought about, you know, because I'm one of those people who always has like a writing project and I abandon like 95% within the first couple weeks. <laughs> but I very, I have very rarely given serious consideration to writing a detective novel as much as a grumpy old man I am about the rules because <laughs> like it seems so intimidating to like have the puzzle. And sort of related to that, um, I will back off from my grumpy old man position a little bit. Uh, there, there is sort of a fine-grained... Uh, they're not binaries. It's not you either have to have it solvable or you have to be surprised. Because if I am being honest, I have never solved a detective novel that I've read ever. I always try so hard. I remember I, I got really into the stor- short stories of a G.K. Chesterton uh, you all should read them. His Father Brown stories. Their, their short stories are all really clever and brilliant. And he would present all the clues. I would stop reading. I would close my eyes. You know, sort of like Sherlock Holmes and his three-pipe problem. And I would try to figure it out. I'd come up with my solution. And I'm always way wrong. <laughs> and I loved being way wrong. I think a good detective writer, like uh, Agatha Christie's great at this, when you read the first time through... You're always just bowled over. It's like this twist that you never see coming. I think especially of like an unexpected guest or even like, and then there were none, Murder of Roger Ackroyd. There are all these twists that the first time you read it, you're like, oh my gosh, I never saw that coming. But, and that's, I love that part of it. So why isn't that one of the rules? Well, like one of the rules has got to be the writer has got to provide a bit of deception. Well, it's not this. The writer has got to give, like, a little bit of a smoke screen as well. Otherwise, and he didn't put that down once. I'm going to defend Lady Agatha Christie's honor right now against <laughs> that assault. Uh, so but I'm not assaulting her. I was him. So what she would do, I think what she would say is, yeah, it was a surprising, but if you go back and reread it and find the clues, I laid the bread trail. If you were just... As clever as uh, Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple, you would have solved it, but you aren't, so you didn't. Well, oh, uh, yes. podcast listener Sarah's just giving me one of those one of those uh, grimaces, Side eye. like 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 I get from my my wife or my mom when I try to get them to buy a llama. Uh, so okay, Sarah, uh-huh. I'm I'm just thinking of it, and then there were none. I don't know how I can talk about it without spoiling it, but it's <clears throat> there's a character who appears dead but is not and i don't spoiler know. alert i didn't say who <laughs> i don't know how i admit it's been a while since i read it but i don't know how anybody could know that he wasn't dead that seems very i think a reader a shock and... i think if a reader is getting themselves in the mind of the killer they could think what would a clever killer do 
and the steps taken by the killer are uh, spoiler alert in case I give anything away. <laughs> there, there are sort of things you could have you could have thought if you're being creative. Now, were was it all spelled out? I don't know, but I think it was enough that it was still fair play. It just seems like a shot in the dark to, <laughs> to guess that and land on it correctly for for that one specifically. Well, to all of us uh, non Hercule Perros, it seems that way. <laughs> But with someone with his little gray cells working at it, then it's, it's yeah. something different. <laughs> uh, so I want to read, uh, before we sort of go to a slightly different topic, I want to read the oath that all members of the Detection Club were required to make. I believe this was written by, I think it was written by Ronald Knox or Dorothy Sayers. <clears throat> Do you promise that your detectives shall well and truly detect the crimes presented to them, using those wits which it may please you to bestow upon them, and not placing reliance on, nor making use of, divine revelation, feminine intuition, mumbo-jumbo, jiggery-pokery, coincidence, or act of God. Uh, Sarah, do you? <laughs> well, mm, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to limit myself. <laughs> Somewhere up in heaven, Dorothy Sayers is just scowling at you. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, let's sort of go, because I want to talk more about the rules and how to properly uh, uh, appreciate these. And I wanted to do it in the context of two books I read around the same time and I got just very different experiences from. One of them was called In the Woods by Tara French. Tana French? Tara Tana. French. Tana. Tana. And the other one is called The uh, Decagon House Murders by, I'll look up his name in a little bit, uh, but he's one of my favorite, he's the this great uh, Honkaku uh, Orthodox School of Japan writer. So first of all, me and you have discussed how much we both hate In the Woods. Yes, for the same reason. So let's discuss <laughs> that book very briefly, and without giving too many spoilers, why is this book so bad? And it is bad. That's it just bad. objective. It's bad. We'll just say that. It's bad. <laughs> it, talk about breaking faith with your reader. I mean, it sets up this incredible, intense scene with this child coming out of the woods all scratched up, and you don't know what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. I'm going from memory yeah, here, but I'll try to, I'll try to paint, spoil I'll try to paint the picture. Yes. And uh, this is all in the, like, prologue, so I'm not really spoiling anything. Yeah. So the this child and his two friends, they, they go out into the woods and, like, out woods outside of Dublin. They're like 10, 11 years old for a fun day of summer fun. And they don't come back that night. So the police look after them. They look through all through the woods and they find one of the children who is up against the tree. He's so scared that he's digging into the tree trunk. He has blood running in his shoe, but only in his shoe. Like not, it, it, his shoes were off when it was done. His other friends are never found, but he's so scared by what he saw that he cannot remember what it was or how he escaped. I read that prologue and I was like, "I'm in. Let's mm -hmm. saddle up. Come on, come on, Tara or it Tana." Like Twin Peaks. I've never seen Train, Train Peaks, but yes, it's exactly like that. <laughs> um, so I assume you felt the same way from the prologue. Yes. Yeah. It was incredibly gripping and visual, and <coughs> it was like a, mo a scene from a movie. Yes. And yeah, I flipped that page really quick. So, did you slog all the way through the book then? Yes, I did. And... Because I had to find out what happened. Exactly! And then we get to the end, and... We don't find out what happened. <laughs> it's just like Twin Peaks. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was, was there a log so lady in there? mad. Is there a lady so walking mad. around with a log that she could speak to? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of, but okay. I wouldn't put it past her. Um, I mean, there were trees, so... Yeah. yeah right. So, I, I read it on a Kindle... And, you know, with the Kindle, there's, like, this little purse, like, oh, you're 80% done, 90% done. We're getting to the point, it's like, we're getting to the end, it's like, 98% done. It's like, well, they better solve this mm -hmm. thing quick. I mean, flip through, 99% done. It's like, wait a sec, it's over? Is there an epilogue? And then it just ended. <laughs> so then I just got on Amazon and read all the one-star reviews. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, uh. So... I will give a quick caveat. Um, I wrote a very short article over at Mirror Orthodoxy about this, about how much I hated it and loved the Decagon House murders. And after I wrote it, someone on Twitter messaged me saying, hey, I think you were really unfair to this book. If you look at it carefully, she leaves breadcrumbs to the solution. 
me being the lazy person that I am, I never responded to this person, <laughs> and I can't find it. So if anyone out there has solved the mystery, let me know. But for the meantime, I can't stand this book. So let's, Sarah, articulate the rage that we're both feeling. Why did you hate this so much? It, what drew me in was that first image. It mm -hmm. wasn't the mystery that the rest of the book ended up being about. That wasn't super compelling. Yeah, there's like a mystery within a mystery, but the, yeah. the core mystery is when we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. And that's what drew me in, and that's what kept me going through the whole thing when it was starting to get boring. And to not ever find out, it was like I just wasted a bunch of time <laughs> reading this book. If, if it hadn't been a library book, I would have thrown it, probably. <laughs> So, and that, that sort of gets to one of the points we were talking about earlier with the issue of fair play. Mm -hmm. So you were pushing back on some of Ronald Knox's very wise rules. Mm -hmm. But I think it sounds like, to me, a rule that you would say is that, hey, if you present a mystery, you have to tie up all the loose threads. W would that be fair? Yeah, mostly. I mean, they're with the mystery, mm -hmm. the loose ends should be tied up. Yeah. I think not just as a mystery, but as a good story in general, <clears throat> that mm -hmm. it broke faith. Because it's it's like that, that thing they say, it's like a film rule where if you show a gun on the screen, it has to be fired know, at some it? point. It's like Chekhov's gun. Yeah. yeah. It's like you spend all this time presenting this evocative image and then it doesn't go anywhere yeah and i think that's related to the fact that this was very much presented as a detective novel mm -hmm. same if, if it was supposed to be like straight up literary fiction it's like mm -hmm. okay that, that's totally fine that's a literary choice you can make you can clearly tell that french had literary aspirations she's mm -hmm. This might sound meaner than I mean it to. <laughs> I think she's a great writer of sentences. I'm not sure she's a great novel of writer of books because each individual sentence is very beautifully written, but the, the book itself I don't think went anywhere and I don't think it was arranged correctly. But she does a lot of work on atmosphere, characterization, all this stuff is great. But I think what we're both agreeing on here is that because she marketed this as a detective novel, you have to solve the issue that you present. Yeah. That, and that's, that's one the, of the genre first issue she yeah. presented. It came before anything else. Yes. So it's the thing you get attached to, especially because it was so vivid. Yes. So, so let's, let's compare that to the, the Decadon, Decagon House Murders. Um, so that one, very briefly, it's, uh, like I said, it's in the, the Orthodox School of Japanese Detective Writing, who they, they really draw inspiration from the Golden Age detective novels. And I love them because of this. And this one, it's... Um, I read it in translation, so who knows if it's the translator or the writer. But the writing style is fine. You know, it's pretty utilitarian. But they have this very elaborate puzzle. It has diagrams and everything. <laughs> and they solve the puzzle. And if you are clever enough, you can solve it. I didn't, but you should be <laughs> able to. So let's take both of those. These are sort of opposite ends of this, the detective spectrum. Which one is better? The one with... No real, some characterization, not much, utilitarian language, but with a fair, satisfying puzzle, or the one with beautiful sentences, lots of characterization, doesn't solve the puzzle. That's easy. I mean, not having read the other one, I just feel like not even, well, yeah, when you're talking about just a mystery, you should present the puzzle and then <coughs> have it solved. Mm -hmm. And I think... French's problem is that it was a misdirect because she placed so much emphasis on that opening scene and that mm. question that everyone who reads it is like, okay, this is the puzzle. Yeah. Now now I want to see someone solve it. And when that didn't happen, it's like, wait, wait a second. Okay, I'm going to go all a law professor on you. Okay. Let's change the hypothetical <laughs> slightly. Let's say that she does solve that core mystery, but she does it through some sort of accident or intuition that the reader couldn't possibly solve on their own. Other than that, the book's the same. Do you think that In the Woods can be a success in that case if they give you a solution, but the reader cannot reasonably be expected to assault it? I would have hated it less, that's for sure. 
Um, <laughs> the rest of it was just, I was just not into it. I didn't, I get to a point where if the characterization isn't great, that I just don't care what happens to these people. And I was definitely at that point. Like, I, the last half of the book, I was only reading it to find out what happened. <laughs> it's scary how much we agree on this book. Um, <laughs> yeah. Isn't it a little bit of a false dichotomy? Well, I kind of want to try to isolate what makes a good detective story. Like, okay. So let, let's try to make it a little bit more abstract. Okay. On the one hand, you have a book with sort of basic characterization, like I said, utilitarian writing, but a really elaborate puzzle that you could theoretically go back and solve. Uh, that's on one side. And on the other side, you have a book with really great writing, really great characterization, but the solution to the puzzle sort of comes out of nowhere, and you can't really solve it. Which is better? Because I feel like that's what really gets to the heart here of why you read detective novels. I would prefer the elaborate puzzle with a simple characterization, I'm guessing you might go the other direction, though. Is that true? I want both. Like I feel like we can't like... have both. That's why this is a hypothetical. <laughs> you cannot have both. You cannot have both. It's a hypothetical. Because I read one. <laughs> they exist. There aren't very many of them because they're hard. But I mean, yeah, I want both. But as far as a good <clears throat> mystery, at its heart, it needs to present a puzzle and then solve it. I think that's the heart of the okay. genre. Okay, to be clear, I agree with you. A good detective novel has both, and it should have both. But I, I do think it's interesting to sort of get this. And so let's change gears slightly to the sort of American phase, um, like the hard-boiled detective that I talked about. So there's some uh, I famous... Love them. <laughs> I, I love them. I too, love them, too, but in a very different way, and I, they kind of irritate me. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about Raymond Chandler. So he was a screenwriter, novelist. Uh, he wrote a lot of the most famous, uh, like I said, hard-boiled detective. Uh, I haven't read many of his. I love them, actually. Um, I've but seen he, more he's of another the one of those guys. He wrote a very famous essay called The Simple Art of Murder, where he tries to just savage the golden age detective genre. <laughs> I'll try to summarize. Uh, he's basically saying, hey, these are unrealistic, all these sort of twee uh, British aristocrats who kill each other with, like, exotic poisonous fish in these, uh, like, mousetrap puzzles. Like, that's that's unrealistic. We need we need a hero who's walking the streets, this uh, streetwise Hercules who will come and uh, fight for the just cause. And he, so his, the, the gumshoes are like this hard-boiled, hard-scrabbled, you know, working-class guy who's working job to job. There, it's a lot grittier. He's a very talented writer, so it, that that part's really good. Um, how do you feel about them, and how do you feel about the answer, the, the sort of <laughs> critique that they have toward the the golden age? I like, I like the grittiness of them. I like the slightly darker tone. Like the darker, the better for me, mystery wise. My favorite is probably the noir. Because yes. they're just hilarious with all their conventions, and I like, I like that sarcastic first-person narrative voice, and <laughs> yeah, I like you know the dame that walks into the office and the femme fatale. I love all that stuff. The dame walked in, yeah. like all dames, she had blah 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so Sam Spade. Yes, yeah. so Sam Spade and like the, Mal the Maltese Falcons, yeah. uh, Dashiell Hammett, but that those are the the famous examples. So yeah, they are really sort of an interesting sort of subspecies in a way mm -hmm. because first of all as much as I really appreciate Raymond Chandler's as a writer and I as creating atmosphere and creating a character I thought his argument against golden age detective novels was kind of silly <laughs> because first of all so after gravity comes out Neil deGrasse Tyson that uh, sort of scientist celebrity guy gets on Twitter is like well, this movie is so realistic. This isn't how gravity works at all. It's like, <laughs> that's not the point. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to see science. We're going to see a fun movie. Like, that's how I feel Raymond Chandler's is. Like, yeah, we know that every time you go to a luxury resort in the Mediterranean, someone doesn't get murdered. We know that. It's weird <laughs> that Hercule Poirot keeps stumbling on this. I don't care. Give me the mystery. <laughs> so there's that. And also, his is also an instance where you have the puzzle there. He solves the puzzle, but he's not an exhaustive plotter. So he definitely falls more into the, the narrative end there. But uh, it, it is sort of an interesting thing, like the, the 
give and tug of the, the detective genre. So now sort of to close out in the, in the home stretch here, I want to talk about why we think detective fiction is so popular. So just to give you a little bit of background here, I, I think it's really odd how, first of all, detective fiction seems to be like an accepted um, sort of like guilty pleasure of like the educated class. You know, like you, you it's not uncommon to see like a, you know, a literary theory professor or some sort of fancy person will have like a, a shelf of Agatha Christie's in like a hidden corner of their office. <laughs> it's sort of an accepted thing that you, you love, but you're sort of afraid to admit you love. I, I saw like... T.S. Eliot was a big fan of detective fiction. He sort of wrote against uh, these sort of uh, Raymond Chandler schools or like uh, Vladimir Nabokov was a big fan of it as well. And then obviously you'll see G.K. Chesterton, Dorothy Sayers, uh, Ronald Knox, brilliant Christian theologians who are also heavily involved in detective fiction. So why does this happen? Why is this sort of a guilty pleasure? And second, what is it about... Christian theologians that seem to have this special draw to solving tales about grisly murders. <laughs> well, tell me what the first one was again. Sorry. What, why is this sort of a guilty pleasure guilty among pleasure. like the, the yes. educated class? That was easy for me because I think about this a lot. I think there's just a, I don't want to say snobbery, but it's kind of snobbery mm -hmm. toward genre fiction in general. Yeah. Like, universally and going way back so mm -hmm. that so that people feel like they have to hide it. Mm -hmm. I think that mysteries become more socially acceptable. Romance is really the one that still gets dogged on and people hide yes. that, which is also stupid, but that's another story. Yeah, I think it's definitely more in the public eye and there are more movies coming out like uh -huh. Gone Girl. I hated it, personally. I hated that book. But the movie, people got really into the movie and liked all the twists and turns. And when somebody sees something like that, they're like, where can I get more of this? So they would find, you find out it's based on a book and then mm -hmm. go read the book and then find out she has two or three more and read those. And they're like, every time a movie comes out or a show there are all these articles that pop up and they're like lists of books to read if you like this and lists of books yeah. to read if you like that. And I just think it's it's slowly becoming less of a thing people feel like they have to hide, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll sort of give my armchair psychologist take on why <laughs> so many theologians and uh, sort of Christian thinkers seem drawn to them. Because <coughs> I think, and... As much as I was dogging on Raymond Chandler, I think he does have a good point about how this we have this sort of very clever sort of uh, uh, Etonian school of quote-unquote evil where they'll try to murder their adversaries in these very clever ways for no good reason. Like, that, that is silly, but I think there is something, a couple sort of Christian themes undergirding it. One, to look at the, it's an examination of the human heart and the depths that even a quote-unquote good person, you know, a respectable country doctor or whatever can slide to when he has something that he thinks he can gain or something he needs to protect or some vendetta he needs to set out. Just basically looking at what even the respectable citizen's uh, heart is capable of. And second, th this was pointed out, I, I heard an interview with uh, P.D. James, who is a really successful mystery author who passed away several years ago. She was also sort of an Anglican of sort of a broader sort, but I, I think she was a religious person. And, and she said one of the values of detective fiction is it teaches you the value of human life, even if the human was a bad person <laughs> or, you know, a, a, a person who caused a lot of other people pain. It's still a tragedy and it still needs to be avenged in some way. You know, it is a total convention of the detective genre that the person who gets murdered is a jerk <laughs> and it's helpful if you're the detective writer because if the person's a jerk, lots of people have have plausible motive to kill him. But the beneath that sort of utilitarian uh, value of it, it, it does show the point that even if a person is a jerk, cause lots of pain around them, they are still valuable and they still deserve to <laughs> have their murder <laughs> solved by the clever detective. <laughs> Wasn't well, that? I mean, that that it would make sense. I think for theologians especially 
grappling with the whole idea of justice because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we all long for this justice and I think a good detective story shows how difficult that really is mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. grapple with because maybe the guy was knocked off justly you yes. know but there's still you know you can't get away with murder mm-hmm. and so we have to have you know what, what is guiding this morality and that's what you see I think in in a good detective story is you see all these people grappling with you know their own darkness and their own junk as they're trying to survive in the house and the revelation who did the murder yeah and that's another way that the these sort of conventions that help the the puzzle can actually make a, a broader you know, pretty important point where again it's a convention that as you go through list of su- suspects Every suspect has like their own like dirty little secret that they're trying to avoid. They have this like dark corner of their soul that they're trying to hide from the world. And I, I think that's apart from the puzzleness of it. I think that does serve a broader point where even like the the glamorous uh, token movie star that you have or like the small village's favorite son, they have their own dirty secrets they're trying to hide. They're not when their lives are examined, there are there are skeletons that can be unearthed there. So yeah, there there are if you want deeper meanings to be had in the type <laughs> yeah. of fiction genre. <laughs> I think I think like at its most basic for me, I'm not saying this for everybody, but it's like good triumphing over evil. Mm-hmm. Like I watch a lot of true crime shows and <laughs> so many. And sometimes the murderer goes to prison, sometimes they go to prison and they get out, sometimes they're never caught. And it's just really satisfying to me to pick up a mystery and know mm-hmm. that the bad guy's gonna get caught unless you know the mystery doesn't get solved <laughs> unless you're ton of french in which case yeah <laughs> just get out yeah so maybe uh so maybe in closing now because we're running really short on time I, I was wondering if we could all sort of go around and give some recommendations for good either individual detective stories or maybe detective series that whether you are a burgeoning fan like Marcus, you don't realize it, but throughout the course of this podcast, you became a huge detective nut. Huge fan. Huge. So whether you're a new huge fan like Marcus or an established old fan, which ones you'd like? So Sarah, can you start us off? I have a list. I'll try. Not <laughs> I had to a feeling you would, all. so that, I'm glad. I won't read them all. I think Marcus would like. Louise Penny is a Canadian writer, and she writes about this Inspector Gamache who solves mysteries, and she has. This lovely. It's kind of a series, but they stand alone pretty well. The Beautiful Mystery, and it's a monastery on an island where a murder is committed, and Gamache has to find out who on the island committed this murder of this monk. And it is so, it's so good. Yeah. The one, when I, when I told you you can write, like, great literature and a good Mm -hmm. mystery, I've only read one. (laughs) <laughs> that was like really good. I have like a whole page of quotes from it, and it's a one-off too because I hate everything else he's written. But <laughs> it's called Sunstroke by Jesse Kellerman, and he's the son of Jonathan Kellerman and Faye Kellerman, who both write mysteries. Uh, Jonathan Kellerman's always on bestseller lists, uh-huh. and uh, it was so <laughs> it was so good. It's just this woman who's boss disappears and she has to figure out what happened to him Mm -hmm. but it's so beautifully written and i don't know if it holds up now because my sensibilities for men who write from the point of view of a woman and don't quite (laughs) get there makes me mad makes me think of that that there's this line in a seinfeld when jerry and george are trying to write their pilot script and they're trying to write for the elaine and jerry and george is like what do women say? Yeah, that's... Yes. Oh, yeah. And some of them get it, and some don't. So I don't know. I haven't reread it in a while, so I don't know if it holds up, but it's beautifully written. This is weird, but J.K. Rowling writes mysteries. She's pretty good. They're pretty name. good. They're good. I enjoy them. They are good, and I love the characters. Like, yeah, the characters are great. It's a paraplegic war veteran, and this woman who's just been temping for like a year and she has this whole tragic backstory and he hires her as a temp and then they start solving mysteries together it's really good so it's like the robert galbraith series i think yes and so they're really well done because 
JK's a genius, so obviously she did this well. But um, one of the things I found is they have they have swearing and they have sex in them. They're not like done They're overtly. Not They're not overtly, but it's sort of like it feels like you're going out with like your aunt and you see her, your aunt like get drunk and start telling dirty jokes like <laughs> And JK, what are you doing? It was so jarring having that come from yeah. JK Rowling. But uh, they're, they're, they are good books. Uh, yeah. So if I can sort of hop in uh, with a couple of mine. Uh, so a couple series. One of them is uh, the Brother Cadfill series. So these take place mm-hmm. in, I think, the 12th century in Wales. And the detective is a monk. And it's really good. They're, they're sort of very conventional stories. Uh, but they, they do sort of get some good points. And the detective is a monk who is just very delightful and very wise. Like, it's not often I read a detective novel and the <laughs> detective will say something like, yeah, that is a good, that's a good observation on the, the nature of divine justice. Yes. <laughs> so uh, read that one. And also, uh, obviously, go with uh, G.K. Chesterton. I love his Father Brown stories. And then there is the Charles <coughs> Lennox series, which is uh, by an English author named Christopher Finch. And those are just sort of old school, take place in Victorian England. And he's just sort of this old school, dapper gentleman. And they're very, they're very pleasant. Nothing deep there, just good old <laughs> pleasant mysteries. All right. So with all of that, the lessons I understand them. Follow the rules. Always, without <laughs> no, unblinkingly no. follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if you're new to detect fiction, give it a shot. Try to solve it. You'll fail, but it'll be fun. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Me and you should start a separate podcast about how much we dislike ton of French. Yeah. But uh, thank go you. on and on. Yes. Yeah, so, thank you again for joining us. Really great. And Marcus, take us home with a Saint Anselm quotation. This seems to be fitting. Saint Anselm said. I do not try, Lord, to attain your lofty heights, because my understanding is in no way equal to it. But I do desire to understand your truth a little, that truth that my heart believes and loves. I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe so that I may understand. For I believe this also, that unless I believe, I shall not understand. Till next time.